Tak nebudeme zdržovat pěkné odpoledne vám všem. Vítejte na prvním letošním setkání v rámci Inspiračního fóra. Moje jméno je Marek Hovorka, vedle mě je kurátor Inspiračního fóra, režisér a producent, dokumentarista Filip Remunda. Nás velmi těší, že do České republiky díky pozvání Hlavského festivalu přijela taková velká roková hvězda, jakým je sociolog Filip Zimbardo. O tom, jak je akční, jste mohli vidět v uplynulých dvou týdnech, co všechno během toho času stihl, kromě jaksi přebrání čestného doktorátu, spoustu přednášek pro studentů i pro myslitele v rámci Fora 2000. A cesta končí tak, jak bylo domluveno na Jihlavském festivalu. Tak já si myslím, že relevance psychologie pro dokumentární film je něco, o čem nikdo z nás nepochybuje. Existuje, there is, a, there is a Mr. Zimbardo, there is a one Czech documentary film done by profesor Karel Vachek. And in this film, Karel Vachek, when he is thinking about war in Bosnia, uh, he is stating that instead of sending there 10,000 troops, we need to send there 10,000 psychologists. And uh, this is a something what I learned from this film. And maybe we can, during the discussion and this uh, great opportunity to meet you, we can also touch these topics, uh, relationship uh, of uh, weapons and psy psy psychology in, <coughs> in general. So uh, I'm very glad that we can open this uh, inspiration forum session and uh, let's uh, have a first question. Yes. And because we are at the Documentary Film Festival, let's start with an uh, issue which is very related to uh, these days and these days in the United States, but also uh, it's global question. Uh, many of you know, uh, many, <laughs> many of you know that uh, there is a special voting during the festival, some kind of happening, yeah, to vote between donkey and elephant, uh, Hillary Clinton or uh, Donald Trump. And uh, we just wanted to show that sometimes it's, uh, you know, voting means uh, really deciding between just two options, yeah? Uh, there is no uh, white and no black candidate, but uh, because of the Brexit, uh, we could see that many people just uh, gave a protest vote. And that's the reason why many people are afraid that also in the United States may happen that there will be too many protest votes that Donald Trump can win. And we are very curious What do you think about uh, these elections, uh, about Cl Clinton versus uh, Trump? The audience. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I feel honored. Uh, thank you for. Uh, <coughs> um, being uh, here with me today. So I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about many things. I spent the afternoon with uh, Marek and Philip talking about um, different questions about my life, my childhood, my vision, uh, my idea to uh, bring a hero, my hero project to Prague and, and Kialava as well. And um, so uh, what is really strange today in the Rolling Stone magazine, There's an article, we are now living in the age of fear, which doesn't make sense. People are living longer than ever. Um, the quality of our life in many places is better than it has ever been in the past. Um, um, and um, there are very few countries are dominated by Soviet uh, socialism or Nazis anymore, but still we're living in fear. And that fear is being manipulated by politicians in many countries. The, the manipulation of fear is what politicians do to get power. Uh, in America, uh, it started in 2001 when there was a terrorist attack in New York City on September 11th. George Bush and his team manipulated fear. The terrorists are coming back. They're going to they're gonna destroy your, your life. And then it got to be from vague terrorists to Muslims are coming. And so America went to war in Iraq, illegal, immoral war, which is still going on 11, uh, many, many years later. 
But the same thing is happening now in Eastern Europe. Many uh, politicians, many um, uh, go governors, many presidents are manipulating the fear of people to say there's a new enemy coming. So it's always an enemy. Hitler was the master of this. For Hitler, the enemy was Jews. Jews are proliferating everywhere. Jews are destroying the quality of our life. And therefore, the Jews became the enemy. Now, in Europe, who is your enemy? Something called migrants. Migrants are the enemy. I was in Budapest last year, and you go from the airport to Budapest City, which I now love, I go every year, there were hundreds of billboards, huge billboards like this. The migrants are coming to take your job. Hundreds. There was no migrants in sight. Migrants don't want to go to Hungary. There's no jobs for Hungarians. Migrants want to go to Germany. Through, but, but the Orban government was manipulating the fear a year ago, and it's still there now. So 80% or more of all Hungarians say, we don't want migrants. And the same thing is true of almost every country now. The governments are using a fear of this group. And who are migrants? Migrants are people. They're not, that's the name, is a negative name, migrant, like homeless. They're people who are um, leaving poverty, leaving disaster in Syria, leaving war, leaving terrorism to get a, a better life. Many of them, as you know, are dying in boats uh, on, on the way uh, out of, out of uh, uh, different parts of Africa to, uh, to Europe. Uh, in America, almost every single person in America now came from a family of migrants. America is a, is a model of what migrants can do. The migration from all, every country in Europe and every country in Asia and every country in South America to America made America great. It wasn't easy. Of course, each group that came in was uh, discriminated against by the other ones. Uh, but then it was, we call it the melting pot. We took people from Italy and Poland and Germany and, and uh, Japan and China, and they combined, they became, quote, Americans. Uh, and so instead of being afraid of migrants, instead of saying, we don't want anybody who's different. So different, is, the whole notion of difference is is a fear that we have. It's the basis of all prejudice. The world would be terrible if everybody was exactly like you or me. So difference makes the world interesting. Uh, and so instead of celebrating diversity, we, we fear anybody who's different. Uh, and it goes not just for different, different uh, religion, it goes not only for different uh, ethnic groups. Uh, we have always done the same thing with religion. You know, Every religion that says we are the only religion says all the rest are uh, horrible, terrible, and should be destroyed. So for hundreds of years, thousands of years, there have been religious wars. More wars have been created in the name of God than in the name of the devil, starting with Inquisition and, and so forth. Uh, so, so, so again, my concern is that Eastern Europe is moving away from democracy as America is in some sense, toward returning to totalitarianism, meaning all power to the government. And, and people are willing, when you're afraid, you're like a child, you give up your power, you give up your freedom to, to the dictator, to the, to the leading party. Um, and it's a very bad arrangement because they, they always use their power to get more power. They never use their power to make life better for the people. If you can come back to this uh, duel between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, oh, okay, whom you will vote for? Oh, oh no, no. I, was, I, I, I hate to even think about it. Um, Donald Trump is evil, okay? Uh, <laughs> he's evil and he's stupid and he knows how to manipulate the media. So the media play a big role in this. Uh, and they, sh they, are not, they should be responsible for it. The media play a big role, I did a lot of research, on the fear of terrorism. You know, that is, the government, as in the Bush administration, they said, the terrorists are coming. But it was the media, front page stories, you know, uh, we need a terror alert, different colors, you know, uh, you know it's red, yellow, orange, you know, wh what is the, nobody knew, it was like, it was like a cartoon joke. Um, but the media promotes negative stories. Now, psychologists know 
that the human brain was designed to be alert to threats. The way we survive, the way our ancestors survived, is you had to be aware of a threat. You know, it was a sound, it could be a, it could be a, a, a tiger, it could be a, a wild animal or something. So the brain is alert to threats, to danger, so that you respond. And because of that, we overreact to threats, to, and, and we respond with fear. When, when we realize it's not a threat, we relax and go about our business. But now what's been happening, the, the fears have been sustained. Now, what, what um, Donald Trump does, that he's a master at, beside making money, he knows how to manipulate the media. And how does he do it? By saying extreme things, by saying negative things, and every day in the media, and not only in America, around the world, what, what Donald Trump says makes the front page of the New York Times, makes, a, makes the, the beginning of the evening news. And he says crazy things, stupid things. And then he lies, he makes up anything. And he says things that are, in quote, outrageous because he knows the media will put it in. People say, that's a lie. So, well, what difference, it doesn't matter. So when you, when you are um, a person at that level, the truth is irrelevant rather than the truth should be the basis of all, of all politics, truth and freedom. Instead, he, he says whatever he wants. He just said, I just saw last night in the news, Donald Trump says if Hillary Clinton wins the election, it'll be the start of World War III. <laughs> Think about that. You know, how could, first of all, it doesn't make sense, but it makes the news. I mean, how could somebody say that? So the sad thing for me, he will lose the election. There's no question about it. He should lose the election. He knows nothing about politics. I don't know if he's ever even been to Europe. I, imagine if he was, <laughs> in, I'm, I'm serious. Um, Hillary Clinton will be a good president. Again, there, a, lot of the, a lot of the negativity about her is coming from men who, who don't want to see a woman as a, a president of the United States. But she was, she was Secretary of State. She traveled around the world. She met leaders of every, virtually every country in the world. She, she understands politics. She made some mistakes, and she should have said, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, so I, I, I know she will win, but even if, sh if Donald Trump loses, no, when Donald Trump loses, <laughs> when he loses in two weeks, it still means millions, millions, millions of Americans will vote for this man. It's inconceivable to me. I mean, the things he, uh, the last thing we'll say is, again, you know, he says he, he, he'll, he will not allow Muslims in America. There are millions of Muslim citizens in America, good citizens. He will not allow Mexicans into, into America. The entire California agricultural industry depends on Mexican field workers uh, in lettuce, in, in, um, in, uh, uh, in the, wine, uh, the wine industry. Th th they do wonderful work that no, nobody, nobody else will do. So he doesn't even know what he's talking about. And then th the things he says about women, so I, I don't know if you, f f I find them repulsive, ugly. Pink face, white hair, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Big fat guy, and and he said so. Women like him because he has money, you know. Literally, I mean. So there's some women go with the money, and so he has all these beautiful wives. One, two, three. Uh, <laughs> but but then he thinks. But then he has a sense of male entitlement. That means he can grab a woman's breast, he can grab a woman's butt, and he thinks they like it, rather than it's insulting. And then he said the worst thing, and I'll end now. The worst thing I could imagine anyone saying, he said in a, in a videotaped interview, uh, uh, the interviewer said, you, you know, you're always surrounded by attractive women. Your wife, you have this wife, this wife, and your daughter is beautiful. He said, yes, my daughter is a piece of ass. <laughs> my daughter is a piece of ass. He, it's a, on video. It's the most insulting thing a man could say about any woman and you say it about your child. I mean, that alone should have been dis disqualified him. Do you think that he might be a psychopath? 
I would like I would like to return oh, to, yeah. the, okay. to the yeah. to the documentary film because yeah, I would like yeah. to keep it related yeah. to documentary films and there is a one check documentary film yeah. the title is I am Fishhead it's done by Misha right. Votruba he's a psy yeah. psy psychiatrist by the profession yeah. then documentary maker and he's stating in the film or trying to prove the theory that everybody who mm. is on the position like CEO of corporation or politician, right. that these people are mostly psychopaths. So the question is yeah. how, how you as a professional see yeah. the world around you from this perspective. Yeah, I mean, I hate to use labels. I hate to say somebody is a psychopath, somebody is narcissistic. Donald Trump is narcissistic psychopath. <laughs> 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 but aside from that, um, uh, so what, what, what is a psychopath? A psychopath is somebody, in every society, about 1% of all the people are born with this trait, with this quality. Meaning, um, uh, you feel no guilt, you feel no shame. Um, um, uh, and over time, you have a sense of dominance and control. Now, most people, you're a psychopath, and you're a poor person, it doesn't mean anything. S but when you suddenly have money, when you have some talent, you now have power, okay? And many of the, those people either become heads of corporations, CEO, because they know how to control people, dominate people, they know how to get, get people to give them money, or they, be, they become politicians. So there is a s similarity between many politicians in many countries and many uh, heads of corporations. The good news of a, a good corporation like Intel or Apple or Google, in a sense, they are producing uh, products, services that make life better for many of our people. Many of these politicians make life better for them and their followers. They don't make life better for the average person. Uh, you, your family is coming from Sicily, mm -hmm. but you were born in the uh, United States, in, yes. in New York. W w yes. How far do goes your memories? Uh, what, is, what are the first memories of your life? Wow. Um, <coughs> I have a very active memory system. Uh, <coughs> I think I remember back to like age two. Um, um, and uh, we, uh, we grew up in poverty. Um, my family was uneducated. My mother and father, grandparents, nobody ever went to high school. They didn't even go to school. They, and maybe they went to elementary school. And they had no value on education. This is true in Sicily and I Italy, many other countries, because the, uh, the idea is if you're poor, you're, your goal is to get a job, to work. You don't, you don't go to school. And also there is the idea that, uh, it's really Sicilian comes from the mafia, it doesn't matter what you know, it only matters who you know. So if I'm smart and he's dumb, he's got a cousin working for the government, he's gonna get the job. Okay, and not me. So they said, you waste time. You go to school, you, you spend all the time studying. You're, n you're not going to get a better job than somebody who has the connections, okay, that works for the party. So as a child, um, we grew up in poverty um, because my, parent, my <coughs> father never, never worked, my mother didn't work. And we had a family of six. And we lived in a ghetto in New York City. South, New York City has five boroughs, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Long Island, Staten Island, and the Bronx is here. And part of the Bronx is called South Bronx. And it was a ghetto then. It's still a ghetto after all these years, meaning poor people live there. But again, migrant, people from every, you know, blacks, Italian, Irish, German, uh, Armenian friends. So these are all my friends. It was like a mix, mixed race. Um, but we were all poor. But, but then, because nobody had television, you never saw how anybody else lived. The problem with television, suddenly, you're a poor person, you turn on the television, here's people who look like you, have beautiful houses, beautiful cars, uh, and so you become envious. So we were all equally poor. It was like communism. Everybody's equally poor in uh, the communist era. Uh, um, but um, so the only thing, one of the bad things about, two things bad about being poor is that um, there are men, it's always men, only men, who make a business of, of tempting children to do evil things, criminal things for money, to steal from stores, uh, to take, take drugs from, from this person to a drug dealer, to get girls to sell their body for money. And if you're poor, 
you know, you would get $10 or something. In those days, it was like $1,000 now. Some of my friends took the money, took the temptation, and some of them ended up in jail. Me and other friends didn't. So as a little child, I was like a child psychologist. I said, what is the difference between people who give in to temptation and do bad and people who can resist temptation and do good? It's really a fundamental question uh, in religion. Who gives in to temptation, who not? I don't know how many of you say the Lord's Prayer. The, the, and in the Lord's Prayer, what do you say? Dear God, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. So r Catholics, <laughs> Protestants around the world say this all the time. So the whole notion we have of human nature is we are always surrounded by temptation of all kinds. We, it's easy to give in to temptation, and we have to learn willpower is, is this mystical force within us that enables us to resist the evil of temptations. Um, and and so, so, again, it wasn't until I got to be a psychologist that I could answer that question. Why do some people give in to temptation, other people don't? The other terrible thing about <coughs> being poor in those days, you lived in a physically toxic environment meaning there was germs everywhere, meaning you lived in a house where the, the paint was filled with lead, <coughs> lead, lead based paint, uh, which uh, caused uh, problems. Uh, uh, in those days, uh, there were, uh, uh, how should I put, um, uh, horse-drawn carts in the street where horses were dropping manure in the street. And, and the carts would be, s they'd, they'd be selling uh, vegetables or different things. So, so there, was, there was germs everywhere. And, and also poor people didn't practice good health in general. So many children in my era, and I'm talking about 1930s, uh, before most of you were born, developed contagious diseases, scarlet fever, tuberculosis, polio, uh, whooping cough, et cetera. And if you developed a contagious disease, that means you could spread it by touching somebody or coughing on them, you, your family had to put you in a special hospital for poor people that had contagious disease. And I was, when I was five, I was put in a hospital. I was there for almost six months when I was five to, to time five to six, November 1938 to, to April 1939. Um, and I can still remember, I close my eyes, even now, there are a room bigger than this, hundreds and hundreds of beds lined up. <laughs> Children two years old, three, four, five, up to 16. Boys and girls all mixed. And so you had a disease that was contagious, and what is the, tr what is the cure? Nothing. Penicillin had not been invented. Sulfur drugs had not been invented which means there's no cure, which means children died every night. Children died every day. And, and essentially, th the doctors, there's no treatment. You just lay in bed. Um, and what made it even worse was um, that we think we take for granted. There was no music. There was no television. There was nothing to do. There were no activities. Visiting day of parents. How many of you are a parent, have a child? Now imagine your child is in one of these hospitals. How often would you go to visit? Every day, every. Parents were limited to one hour on Sunday. Your child, I'm five years old, my parents could not come except one hour on Sunday. And when they came, what, what, what happened? There was a big glass screen. I could and the parent, your family was behind the screen uh, with a telephone, and you were on the other side, and, and everybody's crying because you look terrible, you don't really, and you want to be with them, and everybody's c touching this, the glass or kissing the glass. And it was one hour, and then they had to leave. And then what would happen is, I was there in the winter of 1938, 39. In those days around the world, uh, before global warming, Winters were terrible, huge uh, snowstorm. My parents, because they were poor, uh, my mother would have to, t we had two younger ch tongue, I had two younger brothers, and my mother was pregnant with my sister. She would have to walk six blocks from our home to the subway, to Metro, 
and then at the end, six blocks from the metro to the hospital. And if it was snowing, she couldn't do it. But what would you do if you're a parent? You call up and say, I'm really sorry, I wish I could be with you. Nobody had phones. Poor people didn't have phones in those days. So you waited, you, I waited all week, and it's Sunday, I'm all excited. And you wait, you wait, and nobody comes. And it was heartbreaking. And maybe they didn't come two weeks in a row. And if you're a child, time gets stretched. So I discovered that the doctors can't help me, my parents can't help me, nobody can help me except what? God. So I become very religious. So it's only me and God. So I say, I, you know, I, I have to, I'm going to survive. I just tell myself, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to die. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I can't, couldn't even imagine what it would be to die. Stupid, so, stupid concept. <laughs> um, I, you know, I said, you know, uh, if anything, I'd rather be immortal than to be dead. Okay. Uh, I'm going to work on, I'm going to, I'm going to work on that. And, um, and so what it meant is every morning when I wake up, I would pray to God, make me, dear God, make me strong and healthy and, and smart and courageous and uh, give me the energy to survive one more day. But the interesting thing was that when children died, it seemed they always died at night. Now, I don't know if that's true in general, but the point is I would wake up and I'd say to the nurse, where's Jenny? She went home. Uh, where's, where's, F where's Philip? He went home. Why didn't they say goodbye? I still remember it. So, oh, they, they were in a hurry. They said, they told me to say goodbye for them. And, pr and this happened every day. So I said, wait a minute. All of us want to go home, but not that way. Because we now had a conspiracy of denial that we couldn't say they died. You know, the they died. You know, that's where they, they're, all, they're dead. So the children me and all the other children and the nurses, we had a conspiracy against death. So we said, we're going, they, they went home. But now I know when it's nighttime, who's coming? The devil. The devil is coming to pick the children for that night. So I know God wouldn't kill little children. So, I, so now, what are you gonna do? The lights go out and there's shadows all around and I start praying to the devil. Hello, devil. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm little Phil Zimbardo. I'm really vulnerable. I don't feel well. I have, I have, I have pneumonia in both lungs, double pneumonia, and I have whooping cough. So I could barely breathe. I mean, it, it's, it was, it's hard to take a breath. I mean, it, it's even, the worst thing is when you had to eat, you, you had to take a big breath and take a bite of food. Uh, <laughs> And so, so I'm telling you, look, I'm really a little kid, I'm, I'm, you know. And then sadly, I said, you know, devil, I know you gotta take somebody, but you know, there's a lot of kids around here. You know. <laughs> I still feel guilty. <coughs> uh, <coughs> and, then, and then what would I do? I would pull the cover over my head to hide, and unknowingly, I started practicing self-hypnosis. I went into a trance, and next thing I knew, it was morning. So I had learned, I had practiced, N essentially out of fear, how to uh, insulate myself against this fear. And I'd wake up, oh, it's a new morning, hey God, thanks, and, you, and, and we, so this went on. So what it, me what it meant was I learned how to be self-reliant. I couldn't depend on the devil, I couldn't depend on my, my parents, I couldn't depend on d d doctors and nurses, I had to depend on myself. And then the other thing I, we had mentioned is the only thing we had See, parents, even if they had money, couldn't give you anything because it was, they, couldn't, they couldn't give you a gift because you, uh, it was contagious. They couldn't take it home. The only thing we had is comic books. Superhero comic books. Had just started in 1939, Captain Marvel comic books. And we would consume them. We'd pass them around from bed to bed. And, and then uh, the, the older children, you know, they would be talking about the story and I said, how do you know that? He said, well, it says you could read it. It's not just pictures. So I would say, I hold it up. I said, what is this? It's, uh, these are letters. The other big boy would say, W-O-W, wow. I said, what is wow? You know, wow, it's exciting. And then I would say, I got a pen. I would write down W-O-W with a big exclamation point. So before I, before I went to school, I knew how to read and write. So now I felt good. So now I'm, I'm educating myself. I can't, there's no teachers there. The, the nurses, uh, the nurses, uh, nurses couldn't even come close to you because all children are coughing. So all the nurses had to wear masks all the time. Any, 
so I, I have a vivid memory, and it's, it's, and it's, it, I'm, I'm sorry I talk too long. Once I get started, I get, I get trapped. Yes, I would like to uh, please uh, ask you if you could explain us also the uh, how it was when uh, one uh, would be accepted to the gang on the streets of uh, South uh, Bronx. Uh, there was some initiation ritual. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, there was a store with uh, women underwear. Okay, could you okay. please comment? <laughs> um, so, so, so now one day. So again, um, see. Medicine was really primitive then. I mean, you're lying in bed. They didn't even make you do simple exercises. I mean, you could have, they should, you know, do this, do stretching. You didn't even stretch. I mean, you just were like, like bones. And then one day the nurse said, good news, you're going home. I started to cry, because I thought it meant you're, you're, you're going to be dead. She said, no, no, you're going home. Your parents are here. You're cured, like at a magic. I said, hey, God, yeah, we did this at cool. So, so I went home, and you know, in a wheelchair, I was really, really weak, and I was really skinny. I mean, because again, I barely ate a any food, and I go home to this South Bronx ghetto, <coughs> and um, and I'm really skinny, and I have blue eyes, and I have a big nose. In the South Bronx, the only people who are skinny, have blue eyes, and big noses are Jews, because all the other kids are from different ethnic groups. So I come home, I'm really happy to be home, and kids start running to hit, start hitting me. And I'm running away, I said, what is, I don't understand. And they're yelling, dirty Jew bastard, dirty Jew bastard. I said, I don't know what that is. They were s saying to me, dirty Jew bastard. Little kids, seven years old, 10 years old. Uh, and, and this happened every day. And I, I'm, the only good thing, I learned to run very, very fast. Uh, I, actually, I became, um, a track star when I went to college. I, I was the head of the, the, the varsity uh, track team, uh, starting from that day. But then what happened was, um, one day, you know, it's, uh, I never went out anymore. I said, you know, it's, it's really dangerous, more dangerous in the street than in the hospital. Um, and one day my mother asked the son of the janitor, uh, could he take me to church? Because she was not feeling well. He said, no, he's a Jew, he, he can't go to church. He said, no, no, we're Italian, we're, we're Catholic. He said, oh my God, we made a mistake. <laughs> We've been beating him up because he's a dirty Jew bastard. <laughs> uh, and so, so that made the change. So he says, okay, now you can join our group. <laughs> Not so easy. Um, to join their group, you had to go through primitive initiation rites, like they have in, 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 in uh, native, con native uh, countries. What that meant was the newest, the newest child to be initiated had to have a fist fight with the previous child that was just in the group. And you had to fight until one of you got a bloody nose, and then the fight was over. And I hit, I, obviously I was weak and, and you know, so I was the first one, uh, maybe I even hit my nose to, to get to <laughs> make it. And then the next thing you had to do is, you had to steal. At night they put you in, um, uh, they broke into, <coughs> in, like they put you, I guess, a transom over the door into a grocery store, and you had to steal as much as you could and then you had to show courage. They took your sneaker and threw it up a tree, and you had to climb the tree to recover your sneaker. And then finally, so it's it's um, physical physical strength, courage, um, uh, cunning, uh, steel. And then the other thing is sex. If you're little, what's sex for little kids? There was a store where uh, it sold women's underwear and women's nylon stockings. And so women would go into this store and, you know, try out. Uh, in those days, you could actually try on panties and pantyhose. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the ghetto. Nobody knows. There, there's no, no concept of health, actually. And so, but between the, sta between the street and the store was a uh, railing that, that y you could go underneath, uh, like the, that maybe that's where the janitor lived. And so part of the initiation, you had to go down and you had to look up under the women's dresses as they came in. And you had to tell the other boys what you saw. <laughs> now usually you saw nothing because it was dark. You made up fantasy. Oh my God, I saw this incredible thing. <laughs> so, but th so this was the initiation right. Sex, power, uh, 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 stealing, uh, dominant. And then you got into the group. But you're still, uh, I'm still a skinny little weak kid and I realized, wait a minute, 
the world is really made up of two people. There's a leader and there's a follower. It doesn't make sense to be a follower because sometimes the leaders are stupid, like Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> so so it, makes sen it makes sense to be a leader. So as a little kid, I began to observe, what do boys do? Because again, in those days, boys and girls never played together. So what do boys do who become the leader? Usually, whenever, whenever there's any confusion, they're always the one to say, let's do something, let's try something. When things are boring, they say, let's do this game, let's do this thing. That's one thing, so, so it's always be the first. Uh, secondly, they sometimes had a good sense of humor. When things were difficult, they made a joke. Okay, I, I could do that, I could learn that. And then typically, they had a buddy who was big and strong, like these guys. <laughs> so so, the, so, so I, didn't ha I didn't have to be big and strong. I could say, hey, my buddy, hey, hey Marek. You know, <laughs> this guy's giving me trouble, okay. Uh, uh, and so, so it was a set, set of very simple skills. I began to practice them. And I went from being, you know, the outsider to then being the, the president, of the, uh, president of the club. And it was also good to, to be good in a sport. So I practiced baseball and running. Uh, and so I was, and always, without trying, captain of the team, president, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and finally, I was president of the American Psychological Association of <laughs> 50,000 members. <laughs> And are all these uh, experiences the reason why you decided to study uh, psychology? Yeah, I mean, I didn't study psychology. Psychology was all around me. I mean, it's, it's not like a thing, like you go, I'm going to study Greek history. I go to library and look. I mean, I'm saying I'm interested in why some children give in to temptation and some don't. Why some people are leaders and some people are followers. Why some people are prejudiced? Why would they be? Did, what, what different? I didn't even know what a Jew was. I mean, even if I was, why, why would you ha hate somebody you know who was a Jew? Um, and so, so the things I was interested in, it turned out when I went to college, this is psychology. But in those days, I went to college in 1950, again before you were born. Psychology was boring. Oh my God, boring, 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 boring. Um, and um, and so I switched to sociology, anthropology. And, and later psychology, so, so I had a really broad background. And, and see, I was always interested in um, how you could use knowledge to make the quality of your life better. So I was always concerned, what could I do to make life better for my family? Um, uh, what could I do to make life better in my neighborhood, in my community? Uh, so the idea was always, how do you apply knowledge to improve the human condition. I mean, that was always my orientation. And still, when I was president of the American Psychological Association, that, that was my motto. How do we give psychology away to the public to improve the quality of life? And so for me, it's always, when you do research, you should always think, how can I apply it? How can I, I don't want to write an article to put it in a, a journal, put it in a library f for other psychologists. I, I, wanna, I, want, I want my mother uh, to know about it. I want my friends to know about it. I want you know anybody that I meet to say, hey, I read your book. Uh, I went to your shyness clinic. I'm not shy anymore. So I always try to do, develop new ways of, of thinking, new ways of therapy. But it's always give it to the general public. And do you remember the moment when you decided uh, for this, uh, your famous Stanford experiment, uh, like said, oh, this is something I really want to do, and why? What was the reason at the moment? Okay, um, so um, when I was in high school in the South Bronx, <coughs> there was a little Jewish kid sitting next to me. His name was Stanley Milgram. It's 1948, and Stanley Milgram was concerned that it's not that, f 1948 is not that far from the Second World War, as, as some of you remember, your parents. And he said, you know, could the Holocaust happen in America? Could we do what the Nazis did? And everybody said, St don't be stupid. We're Americans, we're not that kind of people. And he said, little kid, 16, 17, how do you know what you would do until you're in that situation? He said, I'll bet the Nazi, Nazi kids like us said the same thing, we would never do that against Jews, we would never do that. So, so he was saying, as a little kid, we have to be aware of how the situation around us changes us. We all like to believe that when we make a decision, it comes from here. I decide on my fate. 
and we ignore the fact that what we do, what we think, how we dress, our tastes, are really determined by our friends, by our community, by our culture. And, and so he and I were talking in 1949, we, uh, we our class graduated in 1950, about how situations can change people. In 1960s, he did the famous study on blind obedience to authority. And if you remember, that, I will, I'll go, some of you know it, I will go through it. Essentially, he got men, ages 20 to 50, and he also did one later a group of women, to believe that they were teachers helping uh, a student improve the memory, not by rewarding good answers, but by punishing errors. So here he's going to do this really evil study, but, but he dresses it up as um, helping. How are you going to help? By hurting. You're going to hurt your student when he makes a mistake by giving electric shock. So you, you hook up your student to electric generator. There's a big shock box. And when he makes a mistake, you press a button. Bzz, 15 volts. You press another button, 30, et cetera, et cetera. And then pretty soon, the student is yelling and screaming, I have a heart condition. I don't want to go on. I, I, I'm suffering. But now the experimenter is a man in a white lab coat said, you must go on. You have a contract. You cannot stop. Of course, if you're free, you do whatever you want. You say, you know, uh, I'm a 50-year-old man. I'm, I'm not a child. Now, when Milgram, w before Milgram did his study, so the question is, the last switch is 450 volts. On the box, it's triple X. Milgram asked 40 psychiatrists, what percent of all Americans would go to 450 volts? They said only 1% because those people would be, as Marek said, psychopaths. Instead, it wasn't 1%, it was 65%. Two of every three Americans, adults, he, he, he tested 1,000 people, went all the way to the end. Nobody could believe it. And, and so w when, I, w when I, you know, I, I knew he had done that, I, I said, Stanley, it's really amazing. You know, you really demonstrate the power of the situation, but it's really rare that somebody says, do bad shit. Hurt somebody, even if you dress it up. You, usually you're playing a role. Uh, you're a teacher, you're a foreman, you're, uh, you're a, a war correspondent. And in that role, the role dis pushes you in a certain direction. Uh, or like you're a prison, a prison guard. If you're a prison guard, what is your role? Well, to present, prevent prisoners from escaping, to prevent prisoners from attacking uh, each other or you. Uh, and so I said, I really would like to do another study on the power of the situation but nobody tells you what to do. You're in a role. So we're going to create really a drama. Namely, we're going to put you in a uniform, costume. We're going to put you on a stage. Like we create a prison-like environment. And we give you a role to play. So you're a prisoner, you're a guard, I'm a superintendent of the prison, et cetera. So, so that was the thing to say, what happens when you put good people in an evil place? So American prisons were then and now even worse, evil places. But suppose you have an evil place where everybody is good. Every single person we picked were American college students, not old men, American college students from colleges all over America who were in California in the sum for summer school. We put an ad in the paper, wanted uh, college students for study of prison life that will go one to two weeks. And then what we did was he said, they, many people answered the ad because they, they, they did it for the money. Um, we said, some of you will be guards, some of you will be prisoners. What would, you, what would you prefer? Nobody wanted to be a prison guard. They said, I didn't go to college to be a prison guard. And now it's 1971. The, the Vietnam War is going on, and many students in America and around the world were against the war in Vietnam. And many students protested uh, I think big protests were in Paris, I don't know, I don't know in Prague, but all in America. And many university administration called the police onto the campus. And they, they were, uh, and the police in many cases beat up students. So students hated the police and by extension hated prison guards. But it didn't matter what they wanted to be, we flipped a coin, prisoner, guard, prisoner, guard. So it means at the beginning of the study, there's no difference in the personality and the traits between those who are guards and those who are prisoners. And we, we, we began our study on Sunday, August 14th, 1971. 
and to make it dramatic, because it's drama, it's really, the reason, the reason why the study is interesting 45 years later, it was unique in, in its dramatic qualities, meaning, how did we begin the study? Okay. So first, all the boys who are gonna be guards, we have them come down the day before. We have them fitted for really nice military uniforms. We have them fix up the prison so they feel it's their prison. The boys who are gonna be guards, we say, wait in dormitory, wait at home. And unknown to them, I make arrangement with the real city police to come to where they are with a, a, a police car, with a siren going, a red light, to come and say, yeah, uh, uh, Billy Jones, you're wanted for violation of penal code, da, 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 da. Put, put your hands out, put ha real handcuffs. Bring them to the police car, search them. Put them in the car, neighbors are looking around. Bring them to a real police station. They photograph them, they fingerprint them, and put them in a real prison cell. So now, even though you think this must be part of the experiment, you're not sure, but you feel guilty because everybody's looking at you, you're in the car, you, you wanna say, hey, I didn't do anything. And then, uh, and then um, the police blindfold them, and my, my assistants come, put them in our car, bring them to our prison. When they get to our prison, they're standing with, with their clothes, and uh, uh, the, the, our, our guards strip them naked. And there's a big mirror, and then suddenly, um, uh, you're, they're standing there naked, one at a time, and have a big mirror in front of them, looking at themselves naked, vulnerable. So we want them to feel vulnerable. And now we say, uh, if you're a prisoner, you must, you must be um, contained. So we spray them, like, uh, against disease or light. And then we put them in a uniform. The, the guards had attractive military uniform. The prisoners were in a dress, a smock, with no underwear, pants. Because we wanted them to be femin we want to feminize them. The only thing they had was a number. Each prisoner had a different number. And we took away their name, and we gave them a number. So that's the start of being dehumanized. They had to remember their number, memorize their number, mem the numbers of all the other prisoners. They had to sing the number. They had to tell stories about the number. And ultimately, they became a number. Later in the, s in the study, when somebody said, hello, who are you? They would say, 819-416. They wouldn't say, I'm, I'm Billy Jones. And so, that, so then our study began. Um, and, um, and as I said, it's the first study. So the Milgram study was one hour. In my study, prisoners lived in the prison 24 hours a day, day after day. Guards worked eight hour shifts. So it means you could observe the gradual change in character. You could observe people getting into the role of becoming a prisoner, of becoming a guard. And what happened is, and, and again, we, we never said you should do or not do anything. Uh, we simply said guards, guards have the power you know, uh, to prevent prisoners from escaping. Uh, prisoners, ha prisoners you know, have the power to rebel if you want, but then he, he, prisoners will get punished. And, and then what happened, it was a drama. It was like, you know, stepping, so I'm videotaping what, what's happening. And what was amazing is very quickly, oh, I'm sorry, the key element, and then we'll, we'll show, we'll show uh, some video of it. On the second day, the prisoners rebelled. They, they locked themselves in their cell. Um, they, they took off, the, ripped off their number. They said, we don't want to be dehumanized. We are, we are people. Uh, we want our identity back. We had three guards who worked eight hours shifts and three backup guards. So we had 12 guards. All 12 came in. They broke down the doors. There was physical confrontation with the prisoners. And then the guard said to me, these are dangerous prisoners. Not these are students acting as if, in their mind, these are dangerous prisoners, and they said, and we have to dominate them. We have to show them who's in charge, who's the boss. And at that point, everything changed. No one used the word experiment after, after the morning of the second day. And then for the guards, it's like each day, we have to demonstrate that we have more and more power and the prisoners have less and less. The other thing is that your job is, as a guard, you have eight hours. It's a long time. Eight hours, you're in a corridor. And you have nothing to do other than, you know, 
if you serve breakfast, meaning you put food out and they eat. So the guards would think up things for the prisoners to do, to entertain the guards, entertain themselves. So the prisoners began to be like playthings. So the guards, in order to avoid the boredom of the situation, boring job, they, they started to think of creative things to make the prisoners do as uh, to humiliate the prisoners, to degrade them, but at the same time, it was entertaining for them. One of the guards said, the prisoners were like our puppets, and we were the puppeteers. He said, I mean, later, he said, uh, uh, he said you know, we made those people do things. Those people. These are students. By a flip of the coin, you could have been in the dress, they could have been you. But in a very short time, even intelligent college students forgot because they became the role, they became a prison guard, and the prisoners to them became prisoners. So the last thing I'll mention is that there were a few prisoners who were rebellious. They had actually been in anti-war activities uh, at, at the University of California, other places, and so they were rebels. They, they didn't want to be dehumanized, they, fighting against the guards, whatever the guards said, these are rules, they say, and we're gonna break the rule. And so the guards really, um, try to break the will of those re rebellious prisoners. So um, they would strip them naked, humiliate them, put them in a little uh, a closet, solitary confinement, and then if, if this one didn't want to eat, the, the other two prisoners in their cell, they got no food. If this one broke the law, broke the rule, the, uh, your partners, your cellmates wouldn't get visiting days. Now again, we had parents come, boyfriends come, and then how do you get out of prison? you apply to the parole board. We had a parole board. So we, we did things in the study which were symbolic of what happens in a real prison uh, in, in every way. Um, and what happened is in 36 hours, the first prisoner to be arrested had a nervous breakdown. I look at the chart, normal. We gave each prisoner, we gave each student a seven personality test. Normal, 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 normal. And then the next day, another prisoner breaks down. And the next day, another prisoner. So each day, after the second day, intelligent, normal, healthy college students are having emotional breakdowns, playing the role of prisoner. How could it be? So I should have ended the study after the day two, but we couldn't believe. How could, this, how could this happen? By the end of the fifth day, finally we said, it's out of control. So we're not gonna go the second week, we're gonna end the study. So. And again, so it was, a, it was a big drama back then. But for me, I said, you know, it's a, it's a nice demonstration with Milgram's study of the power of one authority, and this is the power of the situation. And I wrote a few articles, I put it to sleep. But then, some years later, Abu Ghraib uh, a prison's a story broke out, and it made my study uh, uh, relevant. And then just last year, 2015, at Sundance, my, there was a Hollywood movie, not a document, a docudrama made, a, a really fine movie. I was a consultant on the movie. It's about 95% accurate. Uh, and if you want, we could show, uh, we have a, a two minute trailer. And then what I'll do is I'll show you, uh, I, I, I obviously I made a video myself, really for teachers to, to who wanna teach about the power of the situation. And we could show little clips of that. Would you rather be a guard or a prisoner? I don't think I have the qualities to be a guard. Prisoner. Prisoner, I guess. Prisoner. Sounds like it would be a little less work. Prisoner. What's that? Nobody likes guards. <laughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. This experiment will be an extension of my research into the effects prisons can have on human behavior. You're going to be pleased to know that you all have been chosen to be the prison guards. But when in no circumstances whatsoever are you to physically assault the prisoners in any way. So remember, just as you were watching the prisoners, my graduate staff and I will be watching you. All right, gentlemen, we're going to have ourselves a lot of fun. Rule number one, prisoners must remain silent. This 
is an exercise period. Okay, is it just me, or are these guys taking this thing a bit too seriously? Why don't you give me 20 push-ups? <laughs> Look at this guy. He thinks he's John Wayne or something. You address me as Mr. Correctional Officer. This might be an interesting two weeks after all. Why don't you make up your bunk, 8612? I did, Mr. Correctional Officer. Well, that's not what I see. Hey, what are you doing here? Just make that! What was that? You just hit him. You're not supposed to hit him! Should we step in? No. Let the guards figure it out. Let's see where it goes. Good evening, gentlemen. How about we make this one a night to remember? This is all real. They won't let you go. They won't let us leave. Those are not prisoners. Those are not subjects. Those are boys, and you are harming them. Before we show the second, uh, the, the videos that I made, so it's actually a very good movie. It's, as I said, 95% accurate, but the experiment went six days. We ended at the sixth day, August 19th, 1971. The movie is two hours, so it meant there's nothing in the movie that's more dramatic than was in the study. In fact, many, many things in the study that were dramatic had to be le left out. The real reason I ended the study was on the fifth day, um, so uh, the, woman, the woman you see in the movie uh, is my girlfriend, Christina Maslach, half Polish. Maslach is a, a mushroom, uh, some, some of you know. Um, so at the beginning of the movie and in real life, we decide uh, we're going to move in together. We're going to live together as a trial. See if it works. If it works, we get married, we have children, we live happily ever after. Uh, and so she had just started a job at University of California, Berkeley. She had been my graduate student at Stanford, but I, we had to avoid each other, so it's not sexual harassment. But now she graduated, and I say, okay, w I'm gonna do this experiment. She's gonna uh, start uh, teaching at Berkeley. But she's working in the library at Stanford on Thursday and said, hey, how about we have dinner uh, at the, uh, in the evening when, uh, when you, you can take a, a break? So I said, good, come down 10 o'clock. She comes down at 10 o'clock, and at 10 o'clock was the last time prisoners could go to a real toilet. Because after that, if you ha prisoners had to defecate or urinate, they had to do it in a bucket in their cell, which they hated to do. It was, uh, made every, it smell, everything smelled terrible. Uh, hello. Uh, made uh, things, uh, everything terrible. So, but the guards used that as an opportunity to humiliate the prisoners, the last time they could do it. They lined up the prisoners, they put bags, so paper bags over their head, they chained their legs to each other, they were cursing and yelling and screaming and pushing them down. Now the toilet was around the corner, but essentially they took them and elevated, they went upstairs, they went all around the building, and, and th they were playing with them, you know. So the prisoners are blind, they can't see what they're doing. She comes down just as the, the guards are doing this, by then, I had become the superintendent of the Stanford jail. So what do I do? It's a check mark on my schedule. Eight o'clock breakfast, check mark. A 10 o'clock parents visiting. 12 o'clock lunch. Two o'clock parole board hearing. Uh, uh, four o'clock uh, a, pr a prison uh, a priest comes. At, uh, t eight o'clock dinner, 10 o'clock toilet. I look up, it's a check mark. I look at her and she has tears in her eyes. And I said, what's wrong with you? She said, I can't look at this, it's horrible. It's terrible what you're doing to those boys. And she runs out. The prison was in the basement of the psychology department. She runs out uh, uh, in, front of the, uh, in front of the building. And I run after her, we have this I said, what's wrong with you? This is the power of the situation. Nobody has seen this. She said, stop. These are not prisoners, they're not guards, they're boys. And they are suffering and you are responsible, as you saw in the movie. And then, and then I kept saying, no, no, you, you don't understand. She said, stop. She said, I know you. You're a caring, loving professor. You love students, students love you. I don't know who you are. How could you see what I see and not be upset? And I'm still, she said, stop. If this is the real you, 
I don't think I want to continue my romantic relationship with you. Now that's heroic. She's saying, she never said you stop to study. She said, come to your senses. The situation has changed you more than it's changed the, the student. And she said, if you, if, if you don't come to your senses and do the right thing, I don't want to continue my relationship with you. So what it means to be a hero is you take a moral cause knowing that there's a cost. The cost is we would n not, not ever get married. And at that point he said, oh my God, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I mean, it, l it was literally like <laughs> slapping in the face. I said, ha it was like waking up, it was like waking up from a nightmare, the nightmare of the Stanford prison. I said, oh my God, you're, ha how, how can I not see that? I said, okay, I'm gonna end the study tomorrow. Uh, we, let's go to dinner. We, it was like 11 o'clock at night. We have to, I have to plan, I have to bring in all the, the prisoners had breakdowns, all the guards. <laughs> Uh, have to, we have to pay them. I have to arrange for, um, uh, 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 I'm going to meet with, with all the prisoners, then all the guards, and bring everybody together for debriefing. So I have to do all that arrangement. In the movie, the director of the movie, a young, a young director, Kyle Alvarez, brilliant director, who also did the editing, um, um, he decided that the moment I say I'm going to end the study, the movie's over. It's a dramatic point, but it's, it comes and stops. So what he has in the movie, we, I have an argument with her, and she leaves. I go down to the basement, I turn on the TV, and I'm looking at what's happening. And he has 10 minutes of things that really happened, but he compressed it into, uh, uh, it's 10 minutes of the most horrifying images you could imagine. So what the guards actually did in the study is they, they lined the prisoners up, they said, your female camels bend over. Now remember, they have dresses and no underpants. When they bend over, they're behind is showing. They said, okay, you guys are male camels, get behind them. They did. Because at that point, the prisoners are like zombies. Whatever the guards, they, do, they don't even say, they just do. And now they say, okay, now hump them. So, and the, the guards are laughing, it's a joke. Hump is a camel's hump, but it's also slang for sodomy. And in six, five days, college students are simulating sodomy with other college students. And so this is horrendous. Now, I mean, her, her, horrendous that the guards would think of doing that to prisoners who they knew at some level were other college students. And at that point, I come in, I say, the study's over, I'm terminating it, you know, uh, it, it's all over. And, and so he, he used that as a more dramatic ending. You also wanted to show us the original footage uh, yeah. of the experiment, so maybe yeah. we can compare it with the yeah. fiction. So, I, as I said, I did. I have a 90-minute DVD. I'm so sorry I didn't didn't bring some here. Um, it's a 90-minute DVD called Quiet Rage, Q-U-I-E-T, and the reason for that is it's really a wonderful story. The prisoner who was the first to be arrested, the first to break down, his name was Doug Corpy, K-O-R-P-I, uh, 8612. When he broke down, afterwards he, s he couldn't believe. How could he lose control over himself in so, so quickly? He became a psychology major, clinical psychology, and when he graduated, he got a job working in the San Francisco County Jail for 20 years. <laughs> and in that position, he said his job was to raise the dignity of prisoners, because what it means to a prisoner is you have no dignity, that the guards step on you. And what it, what it means when he works with guards as a, as a prison psychologist, he limits their sadism, because he said, uh, when you have that power, the sadist, sadistic impulse is in you, and it seeps out like a quiet rage. So I, I use his statement th as the label for the, for the, for the documentary. Uh, so let's just see two little pieces of it. Uh, uh, I'm bringing a new a group of students down to the basement, and then we'll see some scenes from the actual study. Okay, this okay. is it, right down here. Yeah, it's right down the hallway here. Yeah. This is where it all happened in the summer of 1971. Right down this corridor in the basement of the psychology department is where we converted these offices and storage rooms to prison cells. And we had students like yourself, college students from all over the country, play the roles of either prisoners or guards. This was the yard, the prison yard. Uh, here in this closet was solitary confinement, the infamous hole where the guards put uh, prisoners for punishment. That part was screened off and there was a hidden camera that we recorded everything that happened exactly where 
the video crew is now. Here's one of the rooms that was a cell. In fact, I have a box of old stuff from the experiment I'd like you to see. Hmm. Now, here's a box with an old memorabilia from our study, the, the sign. This is one of the prisoner's uniform, prisoner, prisoner 819. You can see it's really a dress. Here are the chains that the guards gave, made the prisoners wear to remind them of their status. The military uni kind of uniforms the guards wore, their billy club, symbols of power and authority. And you can see over in the wall, one of the prisoners etched the days of the week to mark the passage of time, starting on Sunday, Monday, through the rest of the week. Well, how long did the study last? Well, we were going to run it for two weeks, but we had to end it after only six days. What was that? Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Everybody out. Oh, come on. Oh, oh. Well, gentlemen, here it is. Time for count. I don't want anybody laughing. Let's know. Let's have no laughing now. That's creative evil. While the prisoners are doing push-ups, he has one of the one of the other prisoners sing "Amazing Grace." You know that, uh, and now uh, when I see God, I'm free. And you realize that that you're in chains and and you're made to be like a slave. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask you for one thing, uh, because you are sitting with us in very specific T-shirt. Oh. oh. And uh, I know that after that, ex ex the after that experience, you worked in various places in the world and you investigated on violence in Africa, in Bosnia, uh, in even Abu Ghraib, and th there was a Kurd and you were uh, uh, there as an as a expert. But it seems to me that it led uh, to something, to some project which seems to me very important for you. So would you please uh, explain us what okay, about yeah. is this project? Yeah, let me just take a minute to tell you about my heroic imagination project, and then we'll open for questions from you. I don't know how we're going to do it. At the end, 
I'm always available now to sign books. Some of you have books and take selfies, but I didn't know where we're going to do. I didn't know where we're going to do it. Um, so, um, um, so after the prison study, I got involved in trying to improve the quality of prisons in America. I studied uh, prisons. I studied evil in, in Bosnia in 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 uh, um, in, uh, in conditions, and I, I actually taught in Auschwitz prison concentration camp in Poland. Um, I, wor I helped uh, m make sense of the terrible things uh, American soldiers did in Abu Ghraib. But then I decide, then I wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect, Understanding How Good People Turn Evil. And the last chapter of the book is about it's easy to make good people do evil. In every situation around that we have studied, in real life or in experiments, the majority give in, c conform, comply, obey authority blindly. <coughs> It's the minority, 10%, 20%, never more than 30, who resist. And I said, who are those people who resist? Maybe we should think of them as heroes. And it's the first time, stupidly, that I said, why don't I study heroes? <laughs> the amazing thing is the word hero and hero heroism is not in any psychology textbook in the world. We study violence, we study aggression, we study conflict, we don't study heroes. We study evil. We in psychology and sociology, criminology. We study mental illness. We don't study mental health. That was then. And so I began to say, okay, we know how good people can turn evil. How about can we understand how ordinary people can become heroes? <coughs> and then we want to change the definition of heroes. The original definition of heroes is really men, male warriors, Agamemnon, Achilles, samurai warriors. I said, no, I'm not interested in that or we have religious martyrs as heroes. No, no, I'm interested in ordinary people, college students, high school students, who every day are trained to be compassionate, to be caring, to be loving, to make the world better for other people, starting with your family, your school, your neighborhood, your business, and then ultimately, when you do it all together, you make your, your nation better. So I started in 2008 in San Francisco, California, a project called the Heroic Imagination Project. And what I said is, heroism begins in the mind. Imagine I could be a hero, not a superhero. I could be an ordinary person who stands up, speaks out, takes action against injustice, imm imm immorality, uh, or takes action to help somebody in need. Somebody is hurt, somebody is suffering. And so I am going to be, I'm, so what I, or my, my team said, we're going to train young people how to be sociocentric, not egocentric. <laughs> how in every situation you go in, your focus is, how can I make life better for you? How can I make life better for you? How can I make life better for you? Rather than, I hope people think I'm smart, hope people think I'm cool. Hope people, so it's not about me, it's about we. It's a change of perspective. It's not about I, it's about us. And so heroes make the world better in little ways every day. So we have a program that we train p young people, and now we're, we're trying to do the same thing with business leaders to say, if you're in business, you should not be concerned about profit. You should be concerned about making your employees love working for you, and you should be concerned about making your customers love your product. And if you do those two things, you're gonna make money. If you go in just to make money, you're gonna be open to corruption. So. We have a program, how to become a heroic leader in, in business and maybe even politics. So our program started 2008. We d I developed a number of educational lessons. I call it understanding human nature, your human nature and other people's human nature. And so th there were six lessons. So one of them is, oh, I know, we have one more thing. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll show, we have a short, a short cartoon a Polish student made, um, but, but we'll just one minute. So, so one lesson is, how do you transform people who are passive bystanders, because you're in a group, you look around, nobody's helping, you don't help, into active heroes? Uh, how do you transform people who observe bullying and not only don't challenge the bully, don't help the victim of the bully? How do you transform people who have a fixed mindset, meaning I'm good at A, I'm bad at B, women are good at C, uh, Asians are good at D, which is the basis not only of prejudice, you limit yourself because what you should have is a growth mindset. Every human ability is perfectible with practice, effort, and trying. 
So we have a number of prog another pr program is how do you transform prejudice and discrimination into understanding and acceptance? So each program is like 20 or 30 pages. We give the teachers a script. We give them a, present a, a slide presentation device. We give uh, students ways to answer. And teachers now don't lecture. Teachers are like an athletic coach, and the students are their team members. And if you're an athletic coach, you don't say, some of my players are good, some are not good. No, my job is to bring out each player to the best of his or her ability. And so we change the model of teaching. And teachers don't ask a question, everybody raise their hand. No, the whole class is organized. A boy and a girl are a team, a hero squad. So when I ask a question, why is nobody helping? Each team talks to each other. And then I, the teacher says, one of you want to answer or you simply write down. So our program, so then what we do is we have, I do, tra I go around the world, I do training, and I have some people working with me. Our program now is in 1,500 high schools all over Hungary. In four years, I went, I, I did, tra I trained people in Hungary, in Budapest four years ago. We're in, in Poland, Krakow, in, in, um, uh, in Warsaw, in, in Wrocław. Uh, we are in Sicily, where my, my family, in Palermo, in the ghettos uh, are there. Uh, we're in Geelong, Aus Australia. We're in Bali, Indonesia. Uh, we're about to now be in, in Germany, uh, in, in Ireland, in Portugal, and, and, uh, and also in Slovakia. When I, when I talked in, in Prague uh, last week, many people in the law school, uh, in Charles University, in Vaclav Havel Library, all said, uh, and also uh, there's a, a, a Jewish memorial in Bubni that I was in last week. Uh, some of you uh, should know that in 1943, 60,000 Jews from the town of Bubni were marched through the town quietly carrying suitcases, uh, put it in the, the railroad stations called Bubni, mean drum, put on a train and sent to concentration camp. And the idea is the whole town was silent. Everybody knew what was happening, nobody spoke. So there's a memorial to say, we must never allow silence to cover evil. Uh, and so there's a whole program called Drumming for Bubni. Uh, so they wanna have our program. So now I'm really excited because we might have four or five different programs of our Heroma, Heroic Imagination project uh, in Prague. Uh, and uh, so and let me just show this. I just want to hold this up uh -huh. to say. So there are two things before. Um, um, so in the Second World War in America, there was a, a, a picture of Uncle Sam saying, we want you to, to be in the Army. So for me, it's, it's the Army to be everyday heroes. I want you to be everyday hero. The nearest recruiting station is in, in Poland, Hungary, Italy, United States, and again, hopefully it will be throughout the Czech Republic. Uh, and with that, I want to just show you a, a little cartoon, and then we open for questions. Hello, I'm Phil Zimbardo, president and founder of the Heroic Imagination Project. Our main focus is promoting the idea that heroes are ordinary people who take extraordinary action in challenging situations in their lives. They're effective heroes. They do the right thing when other people are doing the wrong thing, or more often when they're doing nothing. And also to expose evil uh, in all of its many forms as a whistleblower. We believe heroism begins in the mind, begins with thinking about yourself as a hero, thinking about yourself as having an inner hero that we will help express through our lessons, our ways of rethinking the nature of good and evil. Transforming bystander apathy into heroic action. Bystander apathy is what characterizes what's known as the bystander effect. In emergency situations, the more people present Paradoxically, the less likely anyone's to help. That's called a bystander effect. It was generated many years ago by the brutal murder in New York City of the woman Kitty Genovese, where many people heard her screams and did nothing. As soon as one person helps, then in seconds, that help is expanded. Our message is be the one. Be that person who ignores the social norm of doing nothing and creates a new social norm of doing something. This is the time for your questions. If uh, you want to ask something, this is the moment, yes. Uh, uh, excuse me, could you give your name and say what you do, you're a student, you're a teacher, you're a parent, whatever. Thank you. Uh, yes. First of all, uh, thank you for your... You are, you are. Uh, oh, my name is Andrea. Uh, I'm a psychology student and a film studies student in Brno. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, thank you for your work, it's very inspiring. I would like to ask a question about the hero heroism concept. Uh, do you believe uh, that this, uh, these traits uh, go down to the personality level? That means uh, one person can be in one situation the evil one and another be a hero. Or do you believe it is constant through throughout life? Thank you. Really good question. Um, uh, I, I, ha I had prepared a whole talk, hour-long talk. Maybe we, we put it online. Um, and there's a, I use in the middle of the talk a cartoon, which would be the answer to your question. It's two policemen who are off duty. And they're sitting talking to each other. And one says, like yourself, Jerome, I'm a complex mix of positive and negative personality traits in me, which emerge or not depending on the circumstance. So the idea is we all have the propensity for evil, and I think we all have the propensity to do good. We have this incredible human brain that can be creative, that can be destructive, and that's where the social situation comes in, that's where family comes in, that's where community comes in, that's where nation comes in that it pushes us in a positive direction or pushes us in a negative direction. And my feeling is, you know, again, going back to what we were talking earlier, in an ideal democracy, the, the government creates conditions which brings out the best in as many people as possible, n uh, n uh, minimizing differences between, between race, re religion, uh, gender, and, and, and uh, financial... Uh, uh, uh <coughs> financial uh, backing. Other questions? So my name is Vladimir. I study script writing. And I'd like you to ask if you aren't afraid that this concept of heroism can be misused by government or the powerful men yeah. as some yeah. kind of spice. You know, if you see something evil which oh, yeah. is against the rules, yeah. tell us and we will punish them. Oh, yeah, I, again, for sure. Um, uh, in, in all fascist regime, they always depend on spies. Um, the communists did it, he, uh, every place, the Nazis did it, and people became spies usually for money. You got, mo you got, got money if you turned, you turned in a neighbor. Um, so th the term hero is a hero is a very subtle term. It really depends on the culture, it depends on uh, the um, hi historical time. Many people who were our suicide bombers said we are heroes for Allah. Palestinians who blew up uh, buses killing uh, Jewish children and, 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 and innocent people said we are heroes for Allah by being a martyr. In Christianity, Christians went to, to the, the Inquisition, you know, went, went to a Arab countries to fight the infidels. So again, it's, it's really, we really have to understand the social context in which somebody is called a hero. Um, and for me, the highest, the, the, anything that violates human dignity, anything that produces human suffering cannot be he heroic. Um, uh, if you're a soldier in war and you kill many enemy, you could get a medal, but that's not heroic. If you save, if you save the life of a, of, of a colleague, then that's heroic uh, in battle. So it, for me, to be a killer, to be a religious martyr is not heroic. Um, and so, but we say, I'm not, we're not creating religious heroes, military heroes, or political heroes. We're creating ordinary young people who every day are going to make the world better. So, so really, that's our th um, a theme we say over and over again. Yes. So, hello. You are. Uh, I'm Karolina, and I study history in German at the Charles University in Prague. <coughs> I would like to have a question back on the Stanford experiment. Uh, I was wondering how the students uh, how did they deal with the experience from the experiment? Because you after. told, yeah, after that, because you told us that one of them yeah. was motivated to study psychology, and what yeah. did the others do, especially those who were in the roles of the guards and did not very nice things? Thank uh, you. And I'm just curious if you put the group again together afterwards. Oh, no, no. Oh. No, okay. Um, 
No, it's a really good question. What happened afterwards? In the looser effect, I have a whole chapter about what were the consequences of the study. Uh, and uh, what's amazing for an experiment, it changed many people's lives. This one, the one student um, changed his life in this way. Um, the, um, my graduate student, Craig Haney, as a consequence of being in this study, not, got not only a PhD, he got a, a law degree. And he is now one of the leading prison litigation people in America. He has, he, has, um, he has helped change the law of the Supreme Court against cruel and unusual punishment, putting p prisoners in solitary confinement. Um, the man who was my um, uh, consultant on the prison, a man named Carlo Prescott, he was a prison, had been a prisoner for 18 years. He had just gotten out of prison. Uh, some student introduced me to him. I made him a consultant, um, and he was the head of the parole board. He had been in and out of prison. He was like a, a, a robber, Rob Banks. After the study, uh, he went on a lecture tour, and he never, never again broke the law. Uh, so in many cases, people, which their life was changed by being in that study. Um, the Christina Maslach, who was, who was the heroine of the study, she began to study the psychology of dehumanization in business. And then she now ha is the, the leading researcher in the world of job stress and burnout. Why do, why do some companies, why do some businesses have employees who burn out, who lose, who lose their, their the caring for other people. And, and then she has techniques how to prevent burnout. Uh, so in many ways, people have been helped. Now, as I said, we spent a whole day with the first the guards, then the prison, then we brought them all together. Uh, they all came back uh, a month later uh, um, uh, because there was some television program that, that um, a program called Chronologue was the forerunner of 60 Minutes, a famous program. And so many of the prisoners and guards were in, in that. Um, and I, I've kept up with many of them um, maybe 20 or 30 years. Now they're all old men. You know, in my mind, I, suppose I, I see th the same faces. But they were 20 years old uh, 45 years ago. So there are a lot of little old men. Okay. Another question. Um, hello, I'm Juana. I work for a human rights film festival in Romania. Where? In Romania. Yeah. Um, well, my question is, do you think that people can be manipulated in, in doing good? Like, because you hear this uh, yeah. rhetoric of, uh, think on uh, harassing women, for example. Think it if it was your mother or your sister yeah. to make it familiar for people and to not harass a person. Yeah. Like, put, the, put your mother's face on that person and then you will not harass her. Yeah. But why would you harass her anyway? Like, it's a manipulation into doing good, but do you think that works? Like, Yeah, oh, oh, that's, it's a really good question. So the issue is the word manipulation. Somehow manipulation always seems bad. Like, we, we get manipulated by the media. We get manipulated by uh, people selling us products we don't want or don't need. We get manipulated by the government. And the question is, can you manipulate people to do good? Can you mani manipulate people who to want to be a hero? So that's, uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm going around the world saying, hey, I want you to be a hero. I want you to do good things. And I'm going to manipulate you. I'm going to tell you all, you're going to be happy, a happier person uh, if you help other people. I want you to form a hero squad. Get people who believe th the way you do, and you oppose evil in your school, in your neighborhood, etc. Um, so, it th so the word manipulation has almost always been used for negative things, and I agree with you. So, all human rights groups, you know, are trying to get people to change their perception of what it means to help, what it means to help migrants, what it means to help uh, poor people, what it means, you know, to help women's liberation. Um, so, so, y so. I, so I guess what I'm agreeing with you, we want to change th the definition of manipulation to, uh, what would be a better word, um, uh, influence. We want to influence you. We want to persuade you. We want to encourage you. Um, we want to um, uh, challenge you to, d to, do, to do different, to see the world differently. Um, and um, uh, 
so yeah, so that so in that sense, I'm a I'm a positive manipulator. <laughs> and the last question, because we are at the Inspiration Forum, uh, I would like to ask, what do you think that documentary filmmakers should document? What they should make films about, or what you want to see the film about? Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm honored to be invited to the documentary filmmaking. It's w it's one of the few uh, festivals that's only about documentaries. Um, as uh, I said, my 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 movie, the Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, um, um, premiered last year at Sundance Film Festival. So Sundance Film Festival, Cannes are the big festivals, but they mix they mix uh, Hollywood movies, blockbuster movies, with documentaries. And in those festivals, the documentaries are at the bottom of the list because everybody wants, because the other ones have the big movie stars, for actors, actresses, etc. They're all the red carpet. Um, so, but the idea is documentary filmmaking really makes us, should make us aware of, of something we, that is happening in and around us that we don't notice. So the documentary filmmaker sees the world differently, makes us, hey, pay attention, look at this thing. This is really good, you know. Expand it, capture it. This is really bad. Don't let don't let it continue. Um, so documentary films, uh, they're expensive, and they never make money because uh, y nobody goes to a movie to pay money to see documentaries. You typically there's a feature film, and there might be a, a documentary afterwards. So we have to support. For me, we have to support documentary filmmaking. M more documentary filmmaking should be worked into television, should be made available, should be in, in, in schools, uh, uh, should be part of our education uh, as well. Um, the last thing is, if I was making a, a documentary, I would make a documentary on the nature of secrets. All of us live in a world in which we tell secrets or we, we are uh, told a secret. And so I would start my movie with little children saying, hey, I want to tell you a secret. In that very act, I make you special. Because um, if I, because uh, you can't tell anybody. So, so starting with that, the, the concept of secret means I'm sharing information, which is private and personal, and it, it, it makes a bond between us. But now, it's a burden on you. Because now you know you have this thing you want to tell everybody, and you, you promised me you didn't. So now it's how do you deal with the burden of secret? Well, you go from that to people who are in a romantic relationship who are cheating on each other. And now you have a secret. You have a secret life that you don't tell your boyfriend, you don't tell your girlfriend, you don't tell your husband, you don't tell your wife. And then there are secrets that people who are trained to be secret agents. Their whole job is to, be a, to uh, have a false, a false persona that you're spying, so it's a secret agent who's a spy for the government against some other government. Um, there are also spies for corporations that try to steal secrets from an other corporation. So for me, it's, I would make, I, I think it's, um, I think when you begin to think, I would like you just to think about it more, to say, this is really a, a really interesting aspect of human nature that nobody has studied, as far as I know. Secrets of children, secrets of, of, of boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, secrets, military secrets, um, uh, how secrets are, are exposed. Uh, suppose you have, s again, we have the, um, uh, the WikiLeaks, uh, Julian uh, Assange uh, uh, and other people who now have information. How do, they, how do they use that for or against people? So again, I think, uh, uh, if there's a documentary filmmaker in the house, I would like to work with them to make a documentary on the nature of human secrets. Professor Zimbardo, thanks very, very much for this great meeting with you. Thank you.